Building in games is a lot of fun, especially when it's combined with a game which lets you adventure. From building massive cities and structures in Minecraft where you can relax before setting off to distant biomes, to Valheim where your base is a safe place to lay down your sword in a world of constant violence. These places give you a sense of accomplishment when you start with nothing and eventually work your way to success, leaving a permanent reminder on the landscape of the journey so far. These are things I've always wanted to do in Skyrim. While you can buy houses and Hearthfire lets you build your own, I've always dreamt of more. What if I could forge a path from nothing to eventually building a city and becoming a Jarl? Well, with mods, I've made that a reality. I can open my own mind to gather materials and start producing goods. I can purchase a plot of land and turn it into a farm providing vital crops for expansion. I can open a port, allow my products to be shipped all over Tamriel. I can create a majestic manor and fully functioning village to house my family and those of my employees. And finally, I can turn an empty and unassuming plain into a grand city bustling with life and opportunity. Let's begin by introducing Alan Allenson, the last of a long line of Allens who were once the owners of the biggest mine in Skyrim. While on a gap year in Cyrodiil, Alan's father passed away and the mine eventually fell into the hands of a group of bandits. Being left the deeds to the mine, Alan returned and made a deal with the Yokel Jarl. He provides cheap materials and goods when the mine is operational, in return for the Jarl getting rid of the bandits. And so, that's where our grand journey begins, on day one with Alan arriving to the newly liberated mine with no experience in building or mining. He has a lot to learn. The first task is clean up the mess left behind by the bandits and try to salvage any materials that can be reused in the mine. Spending all of day one inspecting the condition of the mine and cleaning up pays off, as from the rubbish Alan finds a bunch of logs, iron fittings, stone and some gold which can be reinvested. Day two and Alan gets hard to work using the mine's natural resources, gathering iron which is used to make nails and iron fittings and corundum which is used to make locks also stashing any rare gems he finds to sell. On day three, after a couple of sleepless nights scared of noises and shadows, Alan sets up a small camp next to the mine. Now he can warm himself by the fire and catch a glimpse of the stars before getting a peaceful night's sleep. He also smelts the ore gathered from the previous day to prepare for the day of building ahead, making sure to check his plans so all of the materials needed for his first official building project are accounted for. Day 4 starts with the crafting of nails, hinges, locks and iron fittings, all from iron ingots, which will be used to make the mine's internal scaffolding. The rest of the day is spent building the internal gates to add security to the mine, and then the scaffolding to provide a safe place to work for miners and prevent any cave-ins. On day 5, with some of the leftover bandit materials, Alan makes some minecarts, which could be used to access other parts of the mine and transport any ore gathered to the storage areas. On day 6, using some leftover steel from when the mine was operational, Alan makes the internal material storage. This is where all ores and ingots will be stored before being shipped or made into armours and weapons. And on day 7, Alan makes the internal finished goods storage to store the armour and weapons the blacksmiths will start creating when the mine opens. Day 8, and Alan had finally run out of the scavenged material so headed out to gather some clay and logs. After a walk along the coast and a lovely view of the distant solitude, Alan found a patch of clay and spent the day gathering and transporting as much as possible back to the mine. On day 9 we travel to Morthal, which is the nearest settlement to speak to the mill owner about making a deal for sawn logs. Okay, we've got a lovely little town here, let's have a look around. Good afternoon. Lovely architecture everywhere. What's down here? This looks like the blacksmith. Definitely be paying them a visit. Yeah. We've got a lot of goods to sell to them. Over here, I think, is an alchemy shop. So I might get some fruit and veg. Tavern. Definitely going to pop in there for a drink before I head home. And I think that's what we're here for. Over there is the mill where we can get our sawn logs. So yeah. I'll pop over and speak to the owner now. So I've just finished speaking to the mill owner, he said as long as I cut my own logs, I can take them for a cut price. So I'm going to put them onto this mill, saw them, and then I'll transport as many as I can home. Just need to press this, 
and then it cuts them for me, puts them on a pile, and then I can load them up on a wagon. Job done. One log on its way. With a deal in place to keep any logs we cut ourselves, the rest of the day is spent at the mill, making sure there's enough logs for the next few projects. After transporting the sawn logs back home, Alan spent day 10 making the start of the exterior scaffolding. This will be used as a layout for the buildings needed to support a thriving workforce out in the middle of nowhere. Day 11 was spent building docks. This will be important for transporting goods, but also supporting the mine with fresh fish for food, as well as letting the miners take in the sights along the peaceful river. Day 12, and the food stores ran out, so Alan hunted for meat and for leather that could be used for furniture in the mine. He also bumped into a local garrison of soldiers and stopped by to say hello, making a deal to provide material for their armour and weapon repairs, in return for them patrolling near the mine for protection. Day 13, and with winter fast approaching, Alan needed a permanent home, as the camp wouldn't be warm enough. So he set out to find some stone. This would be used to support the buildings outside, making them tough enough to withstand the harsh winter winds. Day 14 quickly came along, and the entire day was spent building a cabin. For now, it just had a basic bedroll, but at least it'd keep him warm. Day 15, and Alan needed more leather for furniture, so spent the day hunting until he came across a lonely fox. What has happened over here? Hey little guy, you okay? Are you hungry? Let's do some investigating. What's your name? Sweet Roll. Okay, at least you've got a collar. Is this your owner? Okay, he's got some goods on him, let's take them. He doesn't need them anymore. Okay, sweet rolls and a journal. Okay, so I've just read through the journal. This is his owner and his favourite food, sweet rolls. So I'm going to give him one and see what happens. There you go, fella. Okay, you seem to like it. Come with me. Got a home you can live in. Will he follow me? Yes, come on. Let's get you home. I don't know how long you've been out here, but you must be freezing. On day 16, and wanting to get Sweet Roll used to his new home, Alan built a stable and cart. It'd be useful for transport, but until we get a horse, it'll make a comfy bed for Sweet Roll when we're busy outside. Day 17 was the first trip to the big city of Solitude to sell gems and other goods to wealthier people, and to gather supplies to finish the cabin at home. Overwhelmed by a long day of travelling and the vibrant city streets, Alan had an afternoon stroll before setting up his stall to sell some of his goods. Well, good day. Hello sir, you looking to buy? Need something. All right, then. Oh thank you, I'm surprised you didn't steal it but... I'll take it. Hello, sir. What are you looking to buy today? Need something? All right, then. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, okay, I, I think I'll pack up now. I get the I get the points. As the evening rolled in, Alan packed up his shop and sold the rare gems to a local merchant, and with the profit, bought some glass, straw and goat horns for furniture, and after a very busy day, headed into the local tavern to buy a room for the night and get to know the locals. You know what, the people are solitude now to party, they're getting properly into that. After a long night of drink and dance, Alan headed to bed. And while he sleeps off his hangover, now is a great time for you to like, subscribe and turn notifications on. It really helps out a small channel like mine and I'm building a brilliant community here and I'd love for you to come along for the ride. On day 18, after a late start, Alan got a cart ride home and despite the hangover, got hard to work creating the outside forge and storage area. This would be used to convert ore into ingots and prepare them for shipping around Skyrim. We even had a visit from our new friend, the executioner who we'd spent the night drinking with in solitude. What a rare treat that was. 
On day 19, we finally finished the house after getting all of the goods needed from our city trip. So I finally finished the cabin, so I thought I'd do a little tour. In here, we've got a nice little kitchen area, sitting area. Questionable wall mount, but I'm sure I'll grow to love it. Head downstairs. Storage area for all of my food. In here, very spacious master bedroom. Desk to do some late night work. And over here, the best part of it all, a geothermal hot tub. Using a nice little geothermal spring I found under the mine. Uh, in here, Sweet Roll's room. He loves that rug, sleeps on it all the time. It's nice and warm for him. The executioner also stayed in here, and it's a place where the kids can stay if I have them down the line. Day 20 came along, and after a great night's sleep, the mine office and blacksmith was built. The office was very important as it would allow me and a manager to hire workers and allow me to set if the business will store goods or sell them for gold. Day 21 was spent furnishing the office ready for opening day. Lovely new office is done, let's do a little tour of this as well. Got an enchanting room slash storage room, this will let me store all the weapons I make, all of the armour I make and obviously enchant if we go down that route. Okay, in here is where the magic happens. We can store our valuables, but the most important part if we can get past Sweet Roll is the earn and safe. In here, when the mine's operational, we're making a profit, we can collect money from in there. And then finally, my cosy little office area. Nice seat in front of the fire when that's on. The income ledger where I can keep an eye on how much money we're making. And the hiring ledger, where I'll be able to hire the staff once the mine's fully operational. But it's a nice little space, I'm very happy with this. And on day 22, the building was finished, after furnishing the blacksmith quarters to make a cosy place to live and sleep, and creating another workshop outside so they can make goods with a lovely view. On day 23, we build the mead hall. With nothing around the mine for miles, this would be a great place to gather and have some fun in the evenings. Day 24 saw the mead hall get furnished, ready for some wild after work social events. Usual tour of what we've built and this is the mead hall. So we walk in, lovely seating area with a nice art piece. Over here, a very big bar because we're expecting to hire a lot of people and they'll need somewhere to relax once they've done a hard day's work. So plenty of ale, plenty of mead, should be fun. Over here, more seating and a very big fireplace. Up here in the frozen north, it's very cold. So people will be gathering around here with the drinks, warming up and telling life stories. Heading downstairs is a nice kitchen area. You've got an alchemy lab to make some herb mixers to use in the kitchen. Again, cooking pot and a big fireplace. We've got a lot of food to prepare, so this should be really good for that. And then we've got an oven. I've got some test pies in there just to see if it's working okay. But they're not going to be anywhere near as good as the chef's. Over here, I imagine this is going to be a bedroom for whenever people move in. And then here, we've got a guard's quarters. We haven't got any guards or employees yet, but a lot of them will be staying in this building. And I think it looks quite cosy. And then down there is some weird cellar, and the door's locked, so I'm not sure where it goes. But if it's closed, it's closed for a reason, so let's just ignore that. And after 25 long days, the workers' barracks could be built inside the mine. It might be unconventional, but I'm sure they'll add a personal touch when they move in. On day 26, we head to Solitude again to sell some more gems and goods to be able to afford the first workers. They cost quite a lot of gold, so everything valuable we own is being invested to get this mine off the ground. Day 27 is hiring day, and after sending off carrier pigeons with job offers, all we can do is wait. So we have a relaxing stroll down the coast and relax with Sweet Roll before an early night. Day 28 and the workers are finally here, so let's go and say hello. Okay, so I've waited around and all the employees have finally turned up, so we'll do a little introduction. We've got Tovis, who's the main mine manager. He's going to be keeping an eye on all of the books for me, making sure operations are running smoothly. We'll just pop in and say hello to Alsif, how are you doing? Moved in very nicely, efforts operational. Could start making some good money from her, her work. Yeah. As you can see, she's already started. Heading over to the meat hall, someone's brought some chickens and a cow so we can get some fresh eggs and milk. And then also the chef started digging out a garden so we can get things planted. 
And we've popped into the meat hall just to say hello and it's looking busy already. Everyone's settling in, getting to know each other. Jorvan, the barkeeper, how are you doing? We've got our bard over here practicing some tunes. And then a few of our miners enjoying the drinks. Looks really cozy in here, I must say. And then downstairs, chef hard at work. Brought all of his ingredients. We're going to have to get some sort of shipment up because we can't grow much here. And again, he's got some pies in at my request. Looking brilliant. And after the introductions, the drinks are on me as we get to know each other. Drinking in front of the roaring fire and sharing life stories. The bard has a few too many drinks though, so we head downstairs to check on her. Um, you know what? <laughs> I'll leave. I'll leave you to it. I'm continue serenading him. Good luck. Day twenty nine, and it's officially the first day of mining. So we head down to do some inspections and to make sure everyone has sobered up from the last night. Okay, it's the first day. The mine is open, so I'm popping down to do an inspection, see what everyone's getting up to. There might be some hangovers, but I'm sure they'll be fine. Atara over here is mining some iron ore. Should be good for weapons and armor. Stag over here mining silver ore so we can turn that into jewelry. Should be a really good profit. And then in here finally Vogar is mining corundum ore. Which once we melt down we can turn into ingots and locks which are needed for the mine. Day 30 is used to build the guard tower for the mine. With us now producing valuable goods it will give me peace of mind to have some capable warriors close by to keep everyone safe. Day 31 and we have interviews with a number of candidates for guard posts, eventually settling on two day shift guards and two night shift guards. Afternoon Scarvold, anything to report? No, good. You're looking a bit cold up here, I'll make sure to get a fire. Day 32 sees us tell the workers to store the goods we produce so they can be made into materials and then head to Morthal to make a quick deal with the blacksmith to provide him with ore. We can provide this much quicker than his deliveries from Dawnstar and along a much safer route. Day 33, and with the mine in safe hands, we head to Solitude to make some sales. Money is low from the investments, so I sell all of the valuables found over the last couple of weeks. After returning home on day 34, me and the guards build a gate and wall around the mine. This was great advice from the guards and adds extra peace of mind for me and the workers who were worrying about reports of bandits in the area. Day 35 was here and was spent building a fishery. This would provide a great source of food to the community and would let me expand the workforce without worrying about where the next meal was coming from. Day 36 was spent furnishing the fishery, giving the fish a comfortable place to relax and adding all the equipment they would ever need, plus some extra lines so everyone could let off some steam fishing down at the docks, taking in the surroundings. Day 37 and we finally welcomed the new fisherwoman. Okay, let's say hello. Sigvo, welcome. See you hard at work already, got all the fishing lines set up, very good. Caught some fish already, starting to get them into the kitchen, very nice. Bedroom, looks very cosy. Some books there, let's have a look, what are these? <laughs> oh no, <laughs> Lusty Argonian made one and two, okay. And then some sort of religious statue looking right at the bed. Um, bit questionable. Sigva, you might want to turn that statue away when you're looking at those books. Just a just a thought. Okay, speak to you later. Day 38 was more relaxed, taking inventory of the ores we've been gathering since opening. Alan then made the decision to start selling the ores as gold was running out after hiring the new staff. And there was plenty of expansion still to do. Day 39 saw the mine's first official profits after an early morning shipment was sent out to Morthal and Solitude. This was a huge morale boost to everyone who'd been working so hard. Day 40, Alan headed into Solitude to buy some vegetables to plant in the garden and to get some treats for the workers who deserved it for all their hard work. And after getting back got to planting cabbage, carrots and potato which would really help the chef freshen up the menu. Days 41 through to 55 were spent saving up gold for the next expansion. The new mine shaft was an expensive 15,000 gold. All mine profits were collected and put towards the project, and any gems found were taken to Solitude to sell for good amounts of gold. Also travelling to Morthal to personally deliver new ingots to the blacksmith to show off the quality the mine was producing, and generating a regular new order. 
Day 56 was the day Alan had been saving for and he officially commissioned the next mineshaft to be excavated, which would take the workers around 3 days. Days 57 through to 59 were spent waiting for the excavating to finish. Alan took the rare downtime to relax in the cabin and his geothermal hot tub which made winter bearable, enjoying the evenings in the tavern with all of his close friends, plenty of mead flowing, and admiring the progress he'd made over the last couple of months. Day 60 and the excavation was finished, so Alan got hard to work making the scaffold and the workers would need to safely work in the mine, and making the carts needed to transport the ores back to the surface. Day 61 was spent making the new storage for the shaft. This lets workers store the mine door and reduces trip hazards. Day 62 was spent making break areas and furnishings the miners could use. With it being such hard work, Alan wanted to make sure they could relax if they wanted to take a break. On day 63, the last task before hiring new miners was to build them a new barracks to sleep. It'll be cosy once they move in, and the commute to the mine is very quick, so ideal when they want to head back after a hard day's work. On day 64, Alan headed into solitude in the early hours to interview candidates for the new jobs, and after finding his ideal choices, headed home to send out the carrier pigeons with the good news. Day 65, and the new workers had settled in and were hard at work, so Alan did his usual inspection to see what new ores he'd be able to gather and transform into goods. Tidings. Got Silith hard at work, getting Oracalcum, that'll be useful for crafting some armours. Got a very nice break area down here as well, good to see that they're eating well and can relax. Okay, Miner Bonato, mining Quicksilver which can be combined with the Moonstone or Ebony ingots to make some nice armour. Orm and Joftir over here, collecting Moonstone ore which I believe when melted down and combined with Quicksilver makes elven armor and weapons. Days 66 through to 80 were again spent saving money for the final mine expansion, with the next mine shaft costing a huge 35,000 gold. Every bit of gold from the mine was invested, with Alan making a nice profit each day. Any gems had been found were sold, but Alan also had some armor and weapons from the blacksmith which he could sell in the various towns. On day 81, we'd finally managed to save enough to pay for the expansion. And construction officially began, which took until day 83 due to the amount of rock the miners had to break through. Keeping himself busy, Alan helped around the tavern with barkeeping, cooking, and burning the chef's specialty pies, also tending to the crops. Day 84, Alan could begin work on the finishing touches on the final mine shaft, adding in the usual safety scaffolding and getting the mine carts brought down for transportation. Day 85 saw the building of the ore storage area and more break areas for the workers. This shaft was hundreds of feet down, so regular breaks were needed in this stuffy environment. Day 86 was the final building project with the addition of the new minor barracks, ready and furnished for any new hires Alan brought onto the project. Day 87 was a great collection of the last few days' profits, which came just in time to hire the new miners. Day 88 saw the new miners arrive and get straight to work, and Alan's usual inspection taking place. Okay, so the final mine is fully operational, so let's do another quick tour again, see what we're getting out of this one. Jalver hard at work collecting malachite. I think that can be turned into orcish armour if I'm not mistaken. And this room is one of the most important, that important. We have someone sleeping down here all the time, mining as much as possible. And what ore is this, you're wondering? Well, Vermar is mining gold ore. We can turn this into jewellery and should be really, really profitable down the line. Okay, last ore vein. There's a couple having a break here, we'll say hello. How are you guys? Doing okay? Food looks lovely. You know what, I quite like the little break rooms. Nice and cosy, tucked away. But, but enough of that. The last ore is ebony ore. So once that's fully extracted, we can start making really nice weapons and armour. And that should sell for a lot as well. And on day 89, the first profit from the completed mine arrived, which was a whopping 3,690 gold. With no work left to complete, Alan could reflect on all of his progress. From a ruined mine filled with bandits, Alan had transformed it into a thriving community. It had everything it needed to support itself, and the group of people working at the mine were growing closer every day. But 
Alan's journey doesn't end here. He has big goals, and to feed an ever-expanding workforce, he's got to take his hard hat off and trade it in for another. While enjoying the warm fire in his office, he ponders where he can buy land to launch the Allenson farm. Farming in games is a lot of fun. It offers a relaxing alternative to the action-packed nature of games. From building a successful farm through hard work and determination in Farming Simulator, or creating an automated redstone farming masterpiece in Minecraft. These places make you proud when you start with nothing and eventually have a bustling farmstead filled with memories made along the way. A farm is just one of the many things I've always wanted to build in Skyrim as part of a property empire. What if I could forge a path from nothing to eventually building a city and becoming a Jarl? Well with mods, I've made that a reality. I can open my own mine to gather materials and start producing goods. I can purchase a plot of land and turn it into a farm providing vital crops for expansion. I can open a port to allow my products to be shipped all over Tamriel. I can create a majestic manor and fully functioning village to house my family and those of my employees. And finally, I can turn an empty and unassuming plane into a grand city bustling with life and opportunity. So let's begin by introducing Alan Allenson who recently saved his family's mine from bandits and turned it into the largest and most profitable mine in Skyrim, with a growing community of fantastic people from all over Tamriel. With the mine in such a remote and cold location, growing food is difficult. But, while talking in the local tavern with a friend, he was told something that could change everything. So with his personal savings, Alan travelled to Whiterun to speak to a man about a farm, buying the deed and becoming its proud new owner. And so, our journey begins on day one with Alan arriving at the new Allenson farm. The only problem was, it had fallen into disrepair, and the most Alan had ever grown was a cabbage. He has a lot to learn. The first tasks on day one were to set up the tools needed for construction, which were shipped from the Allenson mine in the north, and to set up a small camp to keep him and Sweet Roll sheltered while the farm building was repaired. With both tasks done, Alan heads up to meet his neighbours in Laurius Village and Farm, taking a stroll around town to see what was on his doorstep. Before heading into the farm and asking if he could help for experience, picking some crops and getting to keep a few to eventually get his farm started. And after a hard day's work, Alan got back to camp and sat by the fire, admiring the beautiful night sky. Day two was spent collecting quarried stone for building. Alan didn't have any materials from the mine as he didn't want to affect the business, opting to do everything himself, and after finishing for the day, set off to Riverwood for another hard day of work. On day three, Alan arrived at Riverwood, which had two of the materials he needed for repairing the farm. So I've just arrived in Riverwood, looks like a lovely little town. Sleeping Giant Inn, I'll definitely stop over there tonight for a couple of drinks. Riverwood Trader here. I'll stop in there before I head home tomorrow and sell the gems I've picked up from mining. And then a blacksmith over here. Probably won't be using this much because I'll head back to the mine for any iron, but it's handy to have nearby. And over here is the mill. I think I'll go and speak to the owner, see if I can get a deal in place like I had at the mine. So I can chop my own logs and get them a bit of a cheaper price. So I've got the same deal in place with this mill. I cut my own logs and I can get them a little bit cheaper. I'm going to spend the rest of the day doing this, get a nice pile, and then we can transport them back tomorrow. Spending the full day cutting logs, which would be transported back to the farm to get a lot of projects started. Alan then spent the night in the tavern with the locals. He'd be there a lot in the future, so making friends would make the hard days much more rewarding. Day 4 started with an early morning bath to ease the aches and pains and then a few hours collecting clay to be sent back to the farm with the logs. Luckily, Alan found a couple of gems while collecting the stone, so sold them for some gold, and then headed back home to the farm with all of his new materials. Day 5, and Alan was headed somewhere familiar, back to the Allenson mine for a long day of collecting iron and corundum ore for projects in the farm. He checked with Tovar the manager to see how things were going while he was away, and spent the night having a catch up with good company. Day 6 was an early start to head back to the farm and smelt the ore collected from the previous day at the village blacksmith. And day 7 was spent turning all of the smelted ingots into parts for the building, as well as a shopping trip in the village to get some last minute items. Day 8 and Alan could finally get started on the repairs to the farmhouse, spending all day fixing the damage so it was livable, and crafted the first house key. 
Now, he's the proud owner of his first official house. Okay, so it's looking good outside, but I thought I'd have a look inside. Obviously not furnished yet, but let's have a look around. It's sitting area, living area, I guess. Farmer's quarters. I'm guessing this is where any staff will stay. Nice little cosy place. Upstairs. Guards quarters. Empty again. I think that's the balcony. And then we've got a cellar. Let's take a look inside. Okay, very spacious down here. Obviously, no furnishings whatsoever, and it definitely needs a clean. But, we can set up our bedroll and actually move inside. Day 9 was started with a beautiful sunrise from the balcony of his new house, and then building some basic furniture to make the house more comfortable and ready for staff. On day 10, Alan fixed the fences around the farm plot so he could start to measure how much space he had to grow crops and produce. Day 11 was spent making some furniture for a basement room Alan could use to sleep in and relax. Finally, the camp outside could be packed up, and he and Sweet Roll had somewhere warm to rest in the evenings. And on day 12, the farm office was built. Alan could now hire new staff, keep track of his finances, and had a safe place to store the farm's earnings when opened. Day 13 was spent repairing the farm's water barrel so fresh water could be collected and stored, for watering the crops and providing some drinking water for the workers while they're hard at work. Day 14 and Alan built a stable and cart so a horse could be bought to help transport goods and the neighbours from Laurier's farm came over and helped build an animal pen so the farm could get some cows. Day 15 and the farm's windmill and grinds were repaired. This would allow Alan to turn wheat into flour for baking and the neighbours helped build a hen house even offering to provide some of their new baby cows and chickens. Day 16 was spent building a market stall on the road by the farm. This would be a great place to sell produce to weary travellers on the road, giving them fresh food and milk for their adventures. Day 17, and Alan prepared all of the tools and storage needed for a functioning farm. All that was left now was to hire his first workers. But first, on day 18, Alan helped around the neighbouring Glorious farm to pay them back for offering the baby animals, and worked at the Glorious village blacksmith, earning 100 gold, which would be just enough to hire his first workers. Day 19 was finally the day Alan could get the farm started, hiring some farmers who came recommended from the neighbours. So I've just been up at the neighbours farm over there, they sent a couple of workers my way who they couldn't hire, so I brought in Sigurd, she's going to be running the stall for me, so anyone who comes down this road will pass by this stall and we'll have fresh produce for them to buy, should be a nice little earner. Welcome to the farm Sigurd, hope you're settling well. And already hard at work in the field, we've got Rogvold. Welcome to the team. Looking forward to having you on board. I also managed to get a couple of cows from the neighbours. So if we go in here, we'll produce some milk. Start selling that on the road to passers-by. They gave me some chickens so we can get some eggs, which will be brilliant. And also we've got Soldier the horse. They couldn't keep him, so I offered to take him, so we managed to adopt him for free, which is really good. Normally cost about a thousand gold, which we definitely don't have. And as an added bonus, they've moved in and brought some extra furniture with them. And they've even got some food on the fire, so I'm very happy. And then this is their bedroom. Very nicely decorated, they must have had a lot of stuff with them in their cart. And there must be a couple as well, because they've only got one bed. I'll need to get to know them a bit better to figure that out. Day 20, and after a morning trip to the village market stall for vegetable seeds, Alan helped around the farm, planting some tomatoes, carrots, cabbage, leek, and potatoes, which could all be turned into a lovely stew. Day 21, and with the farmers hard at work, Alan repaired the stairs up to the cliff. This would be a great viewpoint for a guard tower, which was needed as bandit reports were becoming more frequent, and Alan's workers, as well as his neighbours, were becoming a bit wary of this. Day 22, and Alan returned to Allenton Mine for another day of collecting iron after running out of supply at the farm, also taking another opportunity to drink of friends in the tavern. And, while Alan dances the night away, this would be a great time for you to like, subscribe, and turn notifications on. You'd be joining a fantastic community of people, thank you all so much for the continued support.
Day 23, and after smelting the iron overnight, Alan returned to the farm and built a guard tower on the hill, which will provide security to the farm and the surrounding village. Day 24, and the furniture in the guard tower was built, so guards could store their belongings and had a comfortable place to sit on shifts. And Alan forged some weapons and armour in preparation for the guards arriving. Day 25, and needing more gold for future hiring, Alan prepared some vegetable soup to sell at the White Run Market, and decided to craft some more armour which could be sold to the blacksmith. Also planting some apples on the farm to make the start of an orchard, which would open a lot of opportunity for new produce. Day 26, and after an early start to the day, it was time to sell the first produce made from the farm. Alan set up his stall next to Carlotta Valencia and her shop and got to work. Welcome ladies, anything you like the look of? We've made our first sale, vegetable soup seems to be quite popular. And another one. We're going to have to wrap this production up, I think. I think we're on to a winner. After a long day of selling goods and getting to know Carlotta, the night was spent in the tavern, and Alan tried his best to impress Carlotta with his chat-up lines. Did you come into the Bannon Mare often? Oh, you're keeping a bit mysterious then, I like it. Day 27, and after sleeping at the tavern, Alan sold the gems he'd found mining as well as the remaining armour. Also, checking out the local alchemy shop, where Arcadia mentioned it looked a bit under the weather, which was just a hangover. She recommended wheat and Blue Mountain flowers as a cure, which gave Alan a great business idea, so he collected as many blue flowers as he could find. Day 28, and after returning to the farm, Alan started to plant wheat and the Blue Mountain flowers, starting a small section dedicated to alchemy ingredients before planting some more apples to continue growing the orchard. Day 29 was another hiring day, sending carrion pigeons to the two guards he'd interviewed in White Run the other day. Welcome to the team, Riri. Nice to have you on board. Welcome, Kalia. It looks like you're settling in nicely. Day 30, and after a small banter party was spotted nearby, defensive walls and gates were built, offering an extra peace of mind to everyone working at the farm. Day 31, and with plenty of produce stockpiled and ready to send back to the mine, the farm officially opened its market stall, collecting 230 gold on its first day, and with plenty of produce collected daily, there was no risk of running out. Day 32, and the first crop of alchemy ingredients were harvested and ready to be made into potions. Alan headed to Arcadia's cauldron and agreed to give her a portion of profit for using her recipe, producing his first batch of health potions and making a good amount of gold after selling. On his way out, Alan spots Carlotta and decides to take a massive risk, hatching a plan for tomorrow. Day 33, and Alan catches the first cart ride to Riften, heading straight to the priest to talk about marriage, and buys an amulet of Mara ready for tomorrow's proposal. And on day 34, after arriving back at Whiterun, Alan proposed. Carlotta, ever since I chased off that creepy bard for you, I knew you were the one. Will you marry me? Despite her turning down every other man in White Run, she accepted, and the marriage plan started that night. Day 35, and without wanting to waste time, the couple headed to Riften after Alan picked up some fancy new clothes for the occasion, and at a small ceremony, they were married. Sweet Roll even brought them the rings. Day 36, and after a night in Riften, Alan headed back to the farm to get back to work. Carlotta returned to her house in Whiterun as there's no extra space, but now the farmer's providing care store with its produce, which will help the family make extra gold. Day 37, and the last few days' profits were collected and used to buy materials from Lorius Village. Alan couldn't afford a trip to the mine after being away so much. The rest of the day was spent building a greenhouse, which could be used to expand the range of produce grown on the farm. Day 38 was spent building pots and planters for the greenhouse and adding in some beehives which will produce honey and help pollinate the produce. And on day 39, Alan built and installed the equipment needed to produce meat with honey and more ingredients. This could be a great way of expanding the business. And he could stock Alan's and Mine's tavern with his own brand. He then spent the evening in the kitchen with the workers, getting to know them better. Furniture for a brewer was built on day 40, providing extra accommodation and places to store the ingredients needed for the brewing process. And on day 41, with everything in place for a brewer, 
Alan headed to Honingbrew Meadery to ask if they had any recommendations. After looking over lists of candidates with the owner, Alan made his choice and headed home to send the pigeon with the good news. So I've been doing jobs around the farm for a couple of hours, but the brew has moved in. Looks like he's unpacked. Got all of his ingredients here. Bats ready to go. Alchemy station ready to cut some of the finer ingredients up. And what's this? Meat ingredients. Okay, so he's got a list. Ingredients required for brewing mead using the brewing vat in the cellar of Helyarkham Farm. Okay, so there's a few things we'd need to go out and find, and then we can plant them in the greenhouse and really get this operation going. That's probably a job for another day, but we'll start planting what we've got. Okay, and this is the brewer, Strovar Meadblood. Okay, welcome to the family, and it looks like he's learnt some recipes from the chef at the mine as well. Hopefully your mead's as good as your name. And this is his bedroom. Sorry to disturb you, Strovar, just having a look around. They've made a few test batches of the meads. I might come and join you for some later. I'll leave you to it anyway. Day 42 was spent foraging for ingredients that could be used for mead and buying some of the rare ingredients from White Run. Alan then spent the night with his wife, enjoying a rare opportunity to relax with a book and collected the first portion of his earnings from her stall, which was a very profitable venture. After returning home on day 43, Alan planted the ingredients for mead in the greenhouse. This would allow the brewer to have access to the ingredients all year around. On day 44, with Alan wanting to move Carlotta and her daughter to the farm, he started the foundations of a new house on the hill. Once built, it would have enough room for them all. Days 45 to 47 were spent building a grand manor on the hilltop, a fitting home for a man who'd worked so hard to make something of himself. Day 48, and Alan furnished the bedroom of his new house. Okay, so I spent the day furnishing the bedroom, so let's take a look. Okay, I'm liking this. Definitely fit for a king. Sweet Roll's already made himself a home. Lovely furnishings. Bed looks very comfortable. We've got a chandelier. And a mammoth ornament. That's definitely better than the hawk one back at the mine. No, I'm very happy. Rest of the house needs some work, as in I've not done anything. But no, the bedroom's done and that's all we need for now. Day 49, and with a newfound drive, Alan expanded the farm at areas, leaving extra space for more animals and a large area to expand the variety of crops the farm produces. An alchemy greenhouse was built on day 50. This would keep some of the more dangerous ingredients away from the produce the farm was producing for food. Day 51, and Alan spent the day building pots and planters for the alchemy greenhouse, ready for a herbalist to start nurturing the ingredients. Day 52 was spent doing a few odd jobs around the farm and getting materials from the blacksmith who was now being supplied by the Allenson mine before taking a moment to admire the progress so far. I've just got back from the village up the hill. I thought I'd do a little walk around and show what we've done so far. Admire it a little. A Sigler man in the shop. It's a lot of travellers down this road. It's really profitable. And then walking in, just look at the difference from day one. The house is a ruin. Now completely finished. But workers living in there, really making a home for themselves. Over here, we've got our lovely orchard and every veg we could ever want for. And we're making that much, we can send it to the mine free of charge. We've cut some costs on ship and food there. So just brilliant all around. Making a lot of money and saving money at the same time. We've still got a lot to build, but we've got our greenhouses, our mill and our manor. It's really starting to come alive and feel like a community like the mine did. And we've still got plenty of people to come and join us here as well. Day 53 rolled around and Alan built another tower to increase the security of the local area. And underneath left space for an alchemy shop which could supply travellers with the potions Alan was planning to produce. Day 54 was spent furnishing the alchemy store, making a secure place to sell the potions from and plenty of storage for the ingredients. Day 55 was another hiring day, bringing on board a herbalist to grow ingredients and an alchemist to brew potions. Okay, so the alchemist has turned up. Let's go and say hello. Herbs and vials. Okay, I like it. Okay, they've wasted no time setting up shop here. Looks really good. All the ingredients out. Potions ready for sale as well. I think this is going to be very profitable. Oh, and speak of the devil. Alvinus, welcome. How are you? How are you finding life here? And this is the herbalist, Ankka. Welcome, how are you? 
I've got some herbs for you. I'll give you a hand planting them today. Day 56, and it's another day in Whiterun. Collecting ingredients, the alchemist had ordered. Making use of the alchemy lab to make some more of the health potions to raise some extra gold. Day 57 was a quick trip to Morfell to pick some of the last ingredients from the local alchemist and selling the remainder of the potion stock. After getting home on day 58, Alan planted some snowberries outside as an additional ingredient for pies and worked with the herbalist to plant the rest of the alchemical ingredients in the greenhouse. Day 59, Alan wanted to excavate the hill under the house for extra space for worker accommodation, so he travelled to Alan's and mine to commission the work. After making plans with Tovis the manager, he headed home for work to begin in the morning. Day 60, and the miners arrived and excavated the cave. This was done in record time with them all being experts in the process after months of working for Alan. Day 61, and Alan got hard to work building the walkways in the excavated cave, ready for accommodation to be built, and added a door to the cave to the greenhouse for better access in and out. Day 62, and Alan finished the cave area by separating it into rooms for the workers and building furniture for each of them with the help of some of the staff. Day 63 was spent making new farm tools ready for new staff and crafting new armour and weapons in preparation of increasing the guard numbers at the farm. Day 64 was spent interviewing a white run for new farmers and guards before having a night in the tavern with Carlotta to catch up on the past couple of weeks. Day 65, and with the last few days of profit, Alan hired a new farmer and maid, along with two extra guards. So the last few staff are being hired, let's go and say hello. Who have we got here? Ogvir, I think he's one of the new farmers, welcome aboard. We've got one of the new guards, Verinia. That is some fancy armour, I need to get the blacksmiths back of the mine to make me some of that. Very nice. Welcome aboard. Joffre, good morning, welcome. Done a lot of work here, well done. Finally, we've got some new cows. Finally moved in down here, so we can ramp up our milk production. Day 66 was spent planting fruits and vegetables in the expanded farm area, with an extension to the orchard, and some more popular items being planted to meet demand. Also helping tend to the alchemy ingredients in the greenhouse. Alan also checked how many goods the farm was producing, with all of it ready to be sold at markets and stalls every day. On day 67, with plenty of food goods to sell, Alan and the brewer finally got the first batches of mead. The dragon's tongue mead would go down well at the market, but especially at Alan's and mine, where it could warm up the miners after a long and cold day. Market day fell on day 68, with Alan bringing all of his newly baked goods and the brand new mead recipes. Wanting to raise money for building the manor's furniture and to drum up interest in the goods the farm was producing, it was a great way to show off his products. Oh, thank you. Freshly baked today. Thank you, Alava. Freshly baked today. First mead sale, you won't regret it, it's the finest batch I've made so far. Okay, I think I best pack up, I'm starting to attract the local wildlife. Phew, get off the product. Oh, the chicken's on its way over as well. After saving enough for materials from his market trip, Alan spent day 69 to 75 fully furnishing the house ready for his family to move in. And on day 76, it was finally ready. So the house is finally finished, let's take a look around. First of all, we've got a lovely garden out front, and a beautiful view of the farm and the mountains. Over here, nice little training area for the guards. I've got a little bit of training, but I'm still completely useless with anything combat related. Heading inside, lovely open plan living area, lovely fireplace, beautifully decorated. Can't wait to just sit around and relax with the family when they move in. Very big dining area, so we can host parties with the rest of the staff on the farm. Very well stocked kitchen, absolutely every ingredient you could ever need. Farm produces that much, we can just stock it all year round. 
in here, nice little spare bedroom for any companions. Even get the executioner down for a trip. I haven't seen him for a while. We've got a ridiculously stocked storage room. The blacksmiths over at Allen's and mine have been producing some fantastic work and they've been sending me some of the prototypes. Hopefully this will be on the market soon and we can make even more money. Plus I can store some of my weapons here. We've got a storage room for any adventure and supplies and valuables. We do a lot of travel between here and the mine. So it's really handy to be able to store all of that down here. And again, the mine are transporting a lot of the ingots to here so we can sell in the various holds nearby. They've got a room for all of the ores and we can smelt here if we need to. And this room, I think, is the best one by far. Look at this alchemy room. We've been getting a lot of training from the alchemist in the shop and it's really paying off. We're producing a lot of potions. Just look at these illustrations. Absolutely beautiful. But every ingredient we could ever need grown right on the farm, producing hundreds of different potions, and really ramp production up here. In here, the enchanting room. The alchemist uses this more than me, but I'm hoping to get some training. But fantastically stocked, and you never know, we could make some money from this as well. And finally, the house wasn't complete without a little blacksmith studio. I couldn't leave my roots behind. Obviously, I'm not as skilled as the blacksmith back at the mine, so I can only really produce iron and steel. But you know, I'll give it a go and I'm learning. Here you've got a couple of children's bedrooms. Mila's already chosen some furniture to go in this one. And then we've got a spare one for the future. I've already seen my room. It looks as good as ever. But wait till you see what's outside. Come outside and look at this balcony. Breakfast, dinner with that beautiful view and an overlook of the farm. And I've even got my patented geothermal hot tub. Amazing to relax while looking at the night sky. And with the house finished, so was the farm. Alan had turned it from a decrepit and desolate piece of land to a bustling farm producing goods to support itself and Alan some mine. But also making enough produce to sell in towns and villages to make a healthy profit each day. But as Alan sat looking at the night sky relaxing in the hot tub, he realised how big the world truly was and all of the places his products could be sold. He started brainstorming and imagined how opening his own Allenson port could help achieve his goal. Sailing in games is something I spend hours exploring, travelling to distant and uncharted lands, giving me a sense of wonder and discovery. From getting lost in the beauty of the landscape in The Wind Waker, to hunting for treasure and danger in Sea of Thieves. A ship and a bustling port is one of the many things I've always wanted to build in Skyrim to truly let me explore all that it has to offer. What if I could forge a path from nothing to eventually building a city and becoming a Jarl? Well with mods I've made that a reality. I could open my own mine to gather materials and start producing goods. I could purchase a plot of land and turn it into a farm providing vital crops for expansion. I could open a port and build my own ship allowing my products to be shipped all over Tamriel. I could create a majestic manor and fully functioning village to house my family and those of my employees. And finally, I can turn an empty and unassuming plane into a grand city bustling with life and opportunity. So, let's begin by introducing Alan Allenson, who recently saved his family's mine from bandits and turned it into the largest mine in Skyrim, and bought a rundown and forgotten farm and rebuilt it into a supplier of produce and potions for all of Skyrim. With business booming and news of Alan's and Mead reaching all over Tamriel, he knew he had to meet demand. While speaking to sailors in the Winking Skeever, he was told about a derelict port and ship to the west of Solitude. Alan knew this was the break he needed to transport his goods across Tamriel. The only problem was pirates were using the cave as a hideout, and Alan isn't a fighting man. So after striking a deal with Jarl Elisif of Solitude, she sent soldiers to clear the cave, and in return, Alan paid 10,000 gold and promised 10% of all profits made through shipping. And so that's where our journey begins, with Alan arriving at the new Allenson port on day one. With no sailing experience and only a small amount of gold to spend, he has a lot to learn. While the cave might be clear of living pirates, the Yarl soldiers left the bodies. So Alan spends the rest of day one paying the soldiers to come back and clean up their mess. Day two, and after a bad night's sleep due to the strange noises in the cave, Alan uses a small amount of materials he brought to install some lanterns to brighten up the place. Hopefully that keeps any spirits at bay. Day 3, 
and needing to get some firewood to refurbish the various buildings in the port, Alan heads to the Solitude Sawmill and spends the day gathering wood, before spending the night catching up with his good friend the Executioner and letting his hair down with some fine Allenton mead. Day 4 is spent gathering more materials from the shops of Solitude for furniture, and speaking to Captain Aldous of the Imperial Legion to find injured veterans to be guards at the port. Aldous provides a list, and Alan is keen to hire them to give them a second chance after their brave service. Day 5, and after travelling back to the port overnight, Alan arrives and builds a security office at the cave entrance, and furnishes a room for his first employees ready for when the guards get the good news about their jobs. Day 6, and a tiring day, with Alan sending carrier pigeons with job offers, and after a few hours, the new guards arrive and will help protect the port from any pirates wanting to take it back for themselves. Welcome! I'm definitely glad to have you here. I've been hearing some really strange noises in this cave. I've got a feeling it's haunted. I see you're already hard at work. I won't disturb you too much, but welcome. Day 7, and Alan builds a tavern so the guards can have a place to relax. With the nearest town being hours away, it's important for keeping up spirits after a hard day's work. Day 8, and it's a trip to the big city to pick up some more supplies, and speak to the staff in the Winking Skeeva to find a bartender. Alan interviews a few people before deciding and heading back to the port with his choice. Thomas, I'm glad to have you here. I'm very highly recommended from the Winking Skeever. Hope it isn't too quiet here for you. I'm sure you'll get used to it. Day 9, and Alan builds a trader shop. With his plans to turn the port into a busy tourist and shipping area, it would be needed. He also hires a shopkeeper after getting a recommendation from Sima for bits and pieces. Welcome to the port, Alison. If it wasn't a married man already, I'd probably take you as my wife. Alison Allenson has a certain ring to it. And on day 10, Alan had even more arrivals after a couple of people had heard that there might be jobs. So they were hired as dock workers to help with the upkeep of the port. Radwin, welcome. I'm not as young as I used to be, so it's nice to have another pair of hands around here. Hope you settle in. Alan then spent the evening getting to know everyone, with a real community starting to grow. Day 11 was spent building a smelter for processing ore from the Allenson mine. This would be crucial in getting the port, and more importantly the ship, repaired. Day 12 was spent fitting a shack with blacksmithing equipment ready for starting more of the repair work, and Alan left to travel back to the Allenson mine to find a blacksmith and gather materials. Day 13, and after a long day of travelling, Alan arrived at the mine to review how the business was performing and to select a blacksmith who was happy being transferred over to the new port. After a long time away, Alan had a night of catching up in the tavern with some good friends. Day 14, and Alan was back to work gathering a large amount of iron to be used in all of the repair work, and setting up further shipments to be made to the newly built port blacksmith, which could then be sold all over Tamriel. Day 15, and Alan headed to a nearby mill to prepare some saw logs for ship repairs, but there was something a little bit strange about this mill. Stephen and Hearn, I don't suppose I could use your mill tomorrow and cut some logs. Happy to pay. And are your eyes okay? They're looking a little bit bright. Well, I'll see you tomorrow anyway. And after agreeing a deal for the logs, Alan set up camp next to the mill and fell right asleep, almost like he was under some kind of spell. I heard the best way to repel vampires is by liking, subscribing, and turning notifications on. You'd be joining an amazing community of legends and won't ever miss one of Alan's adventures. Thanks again for the support. I can't thank you all enough. Day 16, and despite waking up with a sore neck and a headache, Alan got right to work cutting logs, spending most of the day gathering as much as he could transport back so he didn't have to come back again. Day 17, and Alan built an alchemy shop which could be used to prepare ingredients from the Allenson farm ready for shipping potions all over Tamriel. And on day 18, Alan sent a messenger pigeon back to the farm to ask the alchemist to send his apprentice. She'd more than earned this promotion. Celeste, welcome. Good to have you on board. I've been hearing rave reviews from you back at the farm, so glad to have you here. Day 19, and with all of the beds now taken by the new workers, Alan builds himself a sleeping area in the last building, and realises the port is haunted after spotting one of his clothes mannequins moving. After recovering from shock, he builds a breakfast area so everyone can start the day with some good conversation. And on day 20, Alan had a tour of the finished port to see if he'd missed anything. Okay, so I've finally finished the port. It's looking a lot better than it did when I moved in. And there's a few people here, so I'm not getting terrified by the noises all day long. 
This is one of the workers' rooms. Quite cosy. Here we've got the tavern. Very nice to relax after work, and we've been shipping our own mead from the farm, which has been going down a treat. Everyone enjoying a nice relaxing time after work. Got some more worker accommodation here. Good morning, Braswin. How are you? Over here, communal kitchen area underneath my bedroom, which is up there. But quite nice to have breakfast with everyone down here. Over here, Alice and the Trader. The farm set up shipments here, so we're receiving food, baked goods, things like that, which we can take on the ship once it's up and running and sell. Or we can just buy them here and eat them, which is uh, currently what's happening because they're all lovely. Over here, Jacob's the blacksmith. He's receiving ores and ingots from Alan's and mine, so he can make things here. Saves a little bit on the shipment costs, and again, we can take them on the ship and sell them all across Tamriel. Final bit of worker accommodation. We've got plenty of beds for everyone. It's quite a few people living here now. I wanted to make sure there was enough room. And then finally, over here, our newest addition, Celeste the Alchemist, who we got from the farm recently. Been doing some good work and getting potions ready for shipping. And now the next task, which is going to be a lot of work, is getting this back up and running. We've got a small ship, we're transporting cargo locally. And then if we want to go further afield, we have the Scarlet, which is definitely not seaworthy. It's got a lot of work to get it up and running again. And that is the next task. Day 21 was the start of the ship repairs, and Alan built some basic lighting and furniture in the captain's quarters, ready for him to move in. It'd also be a great place for his second-in-command to relax when Alan isn't around. Day 22, and Alan added some weapon and armour storage to the captain's quarters so he could gather new styles from all around Tamriel. Always using his business mind to come up with new ways to bring exciting ideas back to Skyrim. Day 23 was spent adding the final touches to the captain's quarters with new rugs and plants, as well as setting up a new seating area to relax in with Sweet Roll, who even has his own woolen rug. Day 24, and work began on the upper deck with Alan building some lighting in the passageway and some seating for when crew and passengers are using the ship when travelling. Day 25, and work continued like yesterday, building more lighting in the foyer to make the ship safer and another seating area of cabinets for storing cutlery. Day 26 was trouble after Alan found a leak below deck, so he spent the day in the Arctic waters fixing all of the damage. Sweet Roll even decided to jump in and join him. I didn't know you could swim, Sweet Roll. You'd be terrified when you jumped in the water then. And on day 27, the foyer was furnished with another comfortable seating area, and a nice art wall with space to store any exotic trinkets found while on adventures. Day 28, and finally the foyer was finished with the final decorative touches. It'd be a great place for crew and passengers to relax. Day 29, and suffering from cold after his day in the water, Alan added lighting to the rest of the upper deck, and on the stairs to the captain's cabin. It'd add a nice bit of warmth to the ship, even on the coldest of days. Day 30, and with interest grown in the ship from tourists, Alan made some extra seating areas. He'd be taking goods and people all over the world, so they'd need to do that in comfort. On day 31, Alan added some bookshelves and display cases to the upper deck. With some statement artefacts and a good library of books, it would be a great place to entertain guests. Day 32, and Alan received replicas of the Standing Stones from around Skyrim, as well as a number of shrines. Alan wanted to make sure everyone could pray to their gods, and with the seas of Skyrim being so rough, he'd need someone looking over him. Day 33, and the first guest cabin was fully furnished. For the time being, it could be used by the first mate who would help captain the ship, but eventually would be a luxury room for a lucky passenger going on a journey to a new land. Day 34 and another trip to the city. Alan headed to the Solitude docks to find a capable first mate. He had to be good, as he'd be in charge more often than not while ferrying goods and people across the oceans. And on day 35, the lucky candidate was hired after a few recommendations from the docks. Welcome aboard the Scarlet William, you've come highly recommended so glad to have you here. Why don't you take today to relax and then tomorrow we'll take this ship out on the sea, see if it actually stays afloat. Day 36 was the moment of truth. Would the Scarlet sail? With William in charge, the ship was taken on a test run to solitude. A half-mast, William and Alan could just about manage to ship themselves, 
and everything went to plan. Day 37, and William suggested that the ship should have an armoury to protect against pirates, so Alan spent the day making weapon and shield plaques for storage. And on day 38, the armour mannequins were built. The poor ghosts even came to have some fun again. And after a man claiming to be Dragonborn appeared, Alan bought a decorative skull to display. There's no way dragons exist though, right? Day 39, and Alan made custom sets of armour for the crew. With top of the range uniforms, I'm sure they'd all be happy. He also stocked it with some new swords and bows, made with the finest material from the Allenson mine. Day 40, and Alan built more furniture in the other upper deck cabins, adding more beds and cabinets that could be used in future travel. And on day 41, he added the finishing touches with lighting and decorations to make sure they were as cosy as possible for the crew and guests. Day 42, and Alan started to work on a trophy room, adding lighting and weapon racks. With him wanting to travel the world collecting anything weird or rare, it'd be a great place to display trinkets. Day 43, and through sheer excitement, Alan finished the trophy room, adding in mannequins for armour, and display cases for all sorts of trinkets like dragon masks and legends of Daedric artefacts. And on day 44, Alan woke up to inspect all of his hard work. So I finished the upper deck last night, I thought I'd do a little walk around this morning to show it off. First of all, you come down from the top deck, we've got a nice little storage area, cutlery we need for when we're having feasts. William doing his usual rounds of the ship. Morning, William. Now here's the main sort of foyer. Some more seatings, a lot of storage, display cabinets. Most importantly, we've got some of the shrines so we can pray while we're out at sea. It's always important to do that. And then we've got the standing zone so we can get some of those blessings as well. Head around here, we've got one of the bedrooms. This can either be crew quarters or if we want to transport people they can stay here as well, nice and comfortable for them. Got another crew slash passenger room in here, again very comfortable. In here, one of the most important rooms in the armoury. Got suits of armour and shields for the crew, swords and some bows. They'll help protect against pirates while we're out at sea. And then also, a man claiming to be Dragonborn turned up at the cave and offered me this for sale. So I thought I'd buy that as a nice centrepiece. Never seen a dragon before, but this is amazing. And then if we head up the stairs, this is my room when I'm on the ship, or the first mate if he's in control. Got a nice lovely sleeping area, plenty of room for storage of goods over there. Very comfortable. And then in here is the trophy room. With us travelling all over Tamriel, I thought it might be interesting to see if we can pick up some trinkets along the way. We've got mannequins for rare armours. Got a display for claws. I've never seen one of them, but I think they're worth quite a lot, so it would be interesting if we could find some. Rare weapon display. These are Daedric artifacts. I was also told they were very expensive. It could be nice to collect some of them. And then finally, Dragon Priest masks. The Dragonborn told me about these. I've never seen a Dragon Priest, and I don't think I'd want to. But if we could find some out in shops or in the wild, then it'll definitely be worth collecting. The work doesn't stop there though, and on day 45, Alan gets to work adding in lighting and kitchen appliances in the galley located on the middle deck. This is where a chef will make sure the crew and passengers are well fed on any journey. Day 46, and Alan opens up the wall of the galley to make a small bar area for serving and adds in enough storage for the chef to have weeks worth of produce available on those long trips overseas. Day 47 was spent fitting a bathroom on the ship with a working shower based on Zwemer schematics he'd read about. The last thing Alan wanted was to be stuck on the waves with a bunch of horrible smells. Day 48 and the dining hall was started with the lighting installed and a large seating area built so nights can be spent gathered around the table exchanging stories with mead and good food. Alan even built a bar to store his now famous Allenson Farms mead. Day 49, and the finishing touches were added to the dining hall, with decorations and cabinets added, which could spark some interesting conversations when filled with rare trinkets. Day 50, and the Scarlet was ready to expand her crew. So Alan headed to Solitude to look for deckhands and a ship chef, interviewing a few good candidates, and while here, took the chance to buy some more supplies after selling some of the spare armour he'd been crafting. Day 51, and after sending out more messenger pigeons, the lucky crew arrived at the ship. Just heard our new workers have arrived, so let's go and say hello. Looks like there's one up here. 
Jamison, welcome. Hard at work already. I love to see it. Hope I'll see you in the tavern later on. Keep it up. And then who's this? Sullivan, welcome. Nice to see you settling in. Hope to see you at the tavern later as well. Got a lot of catching up to do. My chef's already hard at work. Riker, welcome to the crew. Got to say, that smells absolutely delicious. Can't wait for some stew and a pie later. Let me know when it's ready. And on day 52, eager to put them through their paces, Alan captained the ship to Dawnstar. Feeling confident on the waves, they arrived in one piece. After admiring the view, he headed on shore and organised a deal with the local ferryman to help get passengers onto the ship for his first paid journey back to solitude. Days 53 to 56 were spent out fitting more guest cabins on the middle deck with furniture. With an additional 12 beds on top of the 8 available on the upper deck, Alan could offer passage to a large number of people. On top of his product shipments around the world, this could be a great additional way of earning. Day 57 and the middle deck passageways were decorated and had lighting installed. A nice touch to make it feel more upper class for any passengers staying on this deck. Day 58 and the stairs to the lower deck had lighting installed after Alan nearly fell down them on a bathroom trip. And a poor guard had felt a bear so the feat was memorialised forever as a decorative touch. Day 59 and with large shipments of ingots from Alan St Mine ready to be taken to Windhelm, the longest journey so far was made. After arriving safely in one piece at the Windhelm docks, Alan made his delivery into the blacksmith and admired the festive decorations before heading back to the dock to check the official manifest for the passengers he was taking aboard back to solitude. A very productive day. Day 60, and after a few complaints about lack of entertainment, Alan outfitted the middle deck with a study. Once filled with books, there'd be plenty to keep passengers entertained. And on day 61, Alan travelled back to solitude to the Bard's College to interview for a bard. With books and a bard to get everyone up on their feet dancing, there would be something fun for everyone. And on day 62, the talented bard arrived. I forgot to introduce Cora, just interviewed her at the Bard's College. Really, really talented. She should keep the crew and guests entertained while we're on long journeys. Day 63, and Alan started on the lower deck which would be used for crucial ship services, adding in lights, some storage and some decorative touches to make it more welcoming. Day 64 was spent furnishing a smithing area which would be used to keep the ship in top condition while out of port and Alan could teach him blacksmithing classes as entertainment. Day 65 and an alchemy and enchanting room was furnished. This could be used to keep alchemy ingredients fresh on long journeys and potions could be crafted en route to make sure they were as powerful as possible when delivered. Day 66 and the crew were complaining about the noise from the passengers so Alan built them their own quarters adding in furniture so they could get a peaceful night's sleep away from the noise of the upper decks. Day 67, and Alan built a break and cooking area for the crew, letting them cook and entertain themselves even when the middle deck galley was closed. Day 68, and the ship was finally fully built, with the addition of lighting in the crew quarters, some decorations, and even a desk so the crew could write home while out at sea. Day 69 and Alan had his biggest test to date, so he headed on a long distance journey to Solsheim with an urgent resupply of ingots for the city of Raven Rock. After arriving and admiring the shores of the first foreign land Alan had visited since arriving back in Skyrim for Cyrodiil, he went to explore. Mead and fresh food from Skyrim, you don't get this anywhere else on Solsheim, come and get it while it lasts. Sweet roll, this isn't like the taverns we're used to. I think we best head home soon. While exploring Solstheim and Raven Rock, Alan can't help but feel homesick. And with all of his employees spread all over Skyrim, he wanted to build a community they could all call home. So as soon as he returns home, his main goal is to find a patch of land to start building the town of Alanstead. I absolutely love Skyrim, but one thing I've always thought was missing is the ability to build your own village or city. A house is always fun to build and decorate, but nothing can beat the feeling of getting an empty piece of land and completely transforming it into a bustling destination. So I decided to fix that with mods. Let's begin by introducing Alan Allenson, who has restored a derelict family mine, bought and fixed an old farm, and expanded his business across Tamriel after fixing an old pirate ship. With a small fortune in gold, he wanted to start his own village to house his family and move in the families of his many employees. 
After looking for leads on empty plots of land in the local taverns, he eventually heard of a plot for sale in Riften, so headed to the city to buy it. And after a dinner spent convincing the local Jarl to sell the land, he bought it for 25,000 gold and promised to start paying tax once the village was established. We join Alan on day one as he arrives at the newly coined town of Allenstead, which has long since been abandoned, apart from one family who operates a slowly failing trader shop. Day one is spent speaking to the last residents, who mentioned the town was destroyed in a dragon attack, and Alan sets up a small camp to get rest before starting his newest project. Day 2, and Alan heads to the nearby settlement of Hartwood Mill to sort all of the wood needed for rebuilding the village, which takes most of the day. The settlement also has a conveniently placed blacksmith, so Alan sets him up with a new contract for ore with the Allenson mine. Day 3, and building officially begins with the construction of a new well. Without clean drinking water, the new town wouldn't have a chance to survive, so this was vital. Day 4, and Alan builds lanterns on the old paths from the previous village. This would help the residents determine the layout of the village, and let building work carry on into the long winter nights. Day 5, and with lack of food becoming a problem, Alan travels to the Allenson farm to gather fruit and vegetables to plant, and spends the night in the kitchen catching up with friends after being away for far too long. And on day 6, Alan travels back to town and plants the vegetables in a small plot behind the trader, which should keep them well fed until more residents move in. Day 7, and a new farmhouse is built on the cliff above the town. This would help the town quickly expand with enough food to be shared around so no one would go hungry. Day 8 is spent sectioning land into farmable area ready for the new farmers, and moving in cows and goats from Allenson Farm to provide milk and fares for the town. Day 9, and the farmhouse is completely furnished with a comfortable living area and kitchen, and bedrooms for the farmers who will be brought in to get to work right away. And on day 10, the first new residents of the town move in after a long journey from the Allenson farm. So let's say hello. So I popped in to see the farmers. It looks like they're already hard at work outside, but we've got Christopher here. Doing some household chores. Very nice to see. Keep it up. Sam, I must have just missed you. Welcome to the village. Very happy to have you here. Karen, welcome. Hard at work, I see. I've had run-ins of Karens in the past, so please don't be one of them. And who's this over here? Looks like one of the goats have got out. Hilda, what are you doing out of that pen? Come with me. Will you actually follow me? It looks like she will. You know what? I might keep you around. A friend for Sweet Roll. And if you've got that pack, you can help me carry things. Come on, let's get back to work. Day 11, and the farmers asked Alan to build a windmill. This would help them turn wheat into flour, which would let them start producing baked goods for the town. And you can't bake without eggs, so Alan gets some town chickens. They seem to be free range and happily roam around town. Day 12 is spent building a new boat dock, which can be used by the town residents for travel, but also allows for shipments to be brought from the Allenson mine and farm near Whiterun, through the local river system right to the dock of Allenstead. Day 13 is spent building the town tavern, needing a communal place for residents to gather and a good income source, what's better than a brand new tavern that sits right on the long road to Riften. Day 14 and the tavern's first floor is furnished with a fully stocked bar and enough seating to host a massive party. Plus, Alan even builds an outdoor seating area so he can watch the night sky with a good bottle of mead. Day 15 and the tavern basement is fully furnished with comfortable bedrooms ready for staff to move in. A new kitchen is installed so the tavern can cook some hearty meals for customers, and it's even stocked with the finest mead delivered from the Allenson farm. Day 16, and Alan spends it getting the second floor ready for guests by furnishing four guest bedrooms for any wary traveller to use, building a brand new bathroom with his custom Dwemer inspired shower, and adding a quieter social area the guests can use to relax. Day 17, and Alan travels to Riften to interview for an innkeeper, bartenders and a bard, News of the opportunity to work for Alan spreads fast and he's soon got a crowd. One at a time please folks, I can't interview you all at the same time, but don't worry, you'll have a chance. And on day 18 with his new staff, Alan heads back home for the first official opening of the town tavern, which he calls the Fox House, after his friend Sweet Roll. Janet, welcome to the Edgewater Tavern. Hope it's up to your usual standards, but I'm glad to have you on board as the innkeeper. Tomorrow, welcome. 
I think you might be busy tonight. I've heard rumours there's a big party coming into town. Izzy, welcome. You've come highly recommended from the Bards College, and you'll definitely be busy. I'm sure you'll be getting a lot of requests for songs tonight. Fresco, welcome. It's definitely a chef's name, very exotic. I'm looking forward to seeing what you can cook up tonight. And while Alan celebrates with the town's first official visitors, this would be a great time for first-time visitors to my channel to like, subscribe, and turn notifications on. That way you'll never miss an upload, and you'll be joining a great bunch of people in this fantastic community. Day 19 and the new tavern has attracted the Fletcher to town, so Alan spent the day building a stall, which will be the start of the new Allenstead market. Jade, how's the stand? Hope business is good. We definitely get a lot of travellers, so you shouldn't have any problem selling these arrows. Day 20, and a travelling wizard also wanted to set up a stall, so Alan built another one. The market was slowly taking shape. Zion and welcome. I don't suppose you've got a spell that'll help me repair these buildings, do you? It's taken me a hell of a long time. And on day 21, the town market was finished after a general goods merchant had his own stall built. Now the residents and travellers would have a great selection of goods to choose from. Slate, welcome. Glad you've decided to set up shop. A little hint, the Allenson Mead is a bestseller. I'd definitely stock some of that. Day 22, and news of the exciting new town was spreading and travellers asked if they could move in. So Alan built a new house ready for an older couple looking for a quiet life in the countryside after escaping the recently destroyed Helgen. Day 23 was spent furnishing the house for the new residents as they had no belongings left. A cosy living area and a comfortable bedroom should be a welcome sight. Hope you enjoy the house, you're the first official citizens of Allenstead. Day 24 and a guard barracks was built. With an increasing number of visitors and residents, the town was a prime target for bandits. Guards would be a welcome addition to ease any worries and keep the residents safe. Day 25 and the barracks basement was furnished with a sleeping quarters for the guards and a custom bathroom and shower. A comfortable break room was added on the first floor of the barracks so guards could relax before and after shifts. Day 26 was a trip to the big city of solitude for a much needed market day, so Alan could sell some goods to raise gold for the new guard hires. And a conversation with Captain Aldous to get recommendations for more war veterans to come and join Alan as the new town guards with plenty of candidates who deserve a new opportunity after their hard service in the war. Day 27 was spent travelling back to Allenstead with the new guards who are keen to get to work in their new custom armour. Welcome, welcome, glad to see you all arrive. I see you found your barracks. Just recently built, it should be comfortable. Let me know if you need anything. And on day 28, after a few drunken incidents in the tavern, the guards asked for an office and some jail cells. So Alan got hard to work to make sure that any troublemakers could be kept secure until city guards could collect them. Bjorn, what's he in for? What, he flashed in the tavern last night while drunk? Yep, keep him in there, we don't want that dodgy old man out. You filthy creature. Days 29 to 32 were spent building brand new town gates and walls around the entire perimeter after a suggestion from the guards. This would allow them to easily keep the town safe from attack and would help them keep track of anyone coming and going from the town for extra security. Day 33, and Alan builds a blacksmith workshop which could use deliveries from the Allenson mine to keep the town guard's equipment in good condition and to provide smelter door for the various projects Alan had planned for the town. Day 34 was spent building the blacksmith studio with a forge, workbench and grindstone for any blacksmithing needs and a fenced off area to keep travellers away from the hot forge and blacksmithing area. Day 35, and the interior of the blacksmith was finished so it could operate as a weapons and armour shop, but also a sleeping area for the new blacksmith when they arrive in town. Day 36, and Alan travels to the Allenson mine via boat and cart to hire blacksmiths who can operate the forge and shop. After speaking to Tovis the manager, he found his candidates. And before heading home, spent a night in the tavern for a now customary catch up over mead and a good song. Day 37, and Alan headed home with the blacksmiths to show them around and properly meet them. Rona, welcome. It's a lot warmer here than it is in Alan's and mine, so I hope you enjoy the change in temperature. I certainly did. Welcome, Hal. How's the forge and shop? Hope it's up to your standards. Day 38 was spent building a pelt shop. 
With hunters from all over Skyrim stopping at the tavern, it'd be a great place to set up shop, and right on the main road it'd have plenty of travelling customers stopping by. Day 39 and the pelt shop was fully furnished with a living and sleeping area for the staff, and a separate shopping area to store the various pelts, as well as bows for any passing hunters. And on day 40, Alan officially hired a hunter and a shopkeeper who had been staying in town for a few days. Welcome to Alanstead, have a good day hunting. Morning Farah, how's business going in the new shop? You're right on the road to hopefully you get a lot of passers by. Speak to you later. Day 41, and after preparing a new site for building, Alan stumbled across rare ore in the ground. So he heads back to Alan's and mine excited by the discovery. He goes over plans with Tovis the manager to bring miners back to Alanstead and can't wait to get back to his mining roots. Day 42, with a bunch of excited miners ready to get to work, Alan heads home and work is completed on the new town mine entrance, ready for further expansion. Days 43 to 45 are spent fully excavating the mine tunnels and identifying all of the ores available. To Alan's surprise, every ore found in Skyrim is in the cave. This is brilliant news as it'll be a great income source for the new town and opens up exciting job opportunities. The cave is also outfitted with new sleeping quarters and even its own underground tavern for the miners to relax in. Day 46, and Alan officially hires all of the new miners who applied to stay at Alanstead. Welcome aboard everyone, how are you enjoying the bar and sleeping quarters? I'm not going to lie, I think I prefer this bar to the tavern upstairs. Anyway, I'll leave you to your drinks. Finishing the day with an evening stroll to admire the town and how far it had come from the once abandoned state he'd found it in. Day 47, and with people arriving from all over Skyrim, demand for houses was high. Alan built an alchemist shop after an alchemist arrived. This would keep the people of Alan said healthy and add another income source to the town which has proven popular with travellers. Day 48 was spent fully furnishing the alchemy shop with the usual cooking and living area, a comfortable bedroom for the owner and her daughter and a shop area to keep stock and serve customers. And on day 49 the new alchemist officially moved in. Annabelle Jules has the new shop. I'll get a shipment from the farm sent up as soon as I can so you can get to work. Hope you enjoy. Day 50 was spent building a new house for a groundskeeper. With so many roads, gardens and lanterns now in town, it was a full time job maintaining them and Alan desperately needed some help. Day 51 and the groundskeeper house is furnished. While it lacks in size, it definitely makes up for in style, boasting a cosy kitchen area and a very comfortable double bed. And on day 52, a new groundskeeper was hired after he turned up in the local tavern. You've got a nice little bachelor pad here, I'm definitely jealous. All I've got is a tent at the moment. Day 53 came along and Alan spent it building a bookstore. He wanted everyone in town to have access to a good education, and what better way to pass the long winter nights than with a book in front of the fireplace. Day 54, and the bookstore was fully furnished with a communal area upstairs to buy books and relax with friends, and a living area downstairs for the owner. And who better to take over the shop than someone from the College of Winterhold. Day 55 and Alan took a car to the Majors College and after a donation to get inside spoke to the librarian. He recommended his best student to become the Allenstead teacher and to take over the running of the bookshop. Day 56 and after travelling home let's introduce our newest magical resident. Selena, good to see you settled in after the long trip back from Winterhold. It's definitely not like the library at the college, but I'm hoping it'll do. Glad to have you here. Day 57, and with adventurers always stopping in town, there wasn't enough space in the tavern, so Alan built a barracks that they could use to relax in between adventures. And on day 58, after furnishing the barracks with a large number of beds and a communal living area, some interesting characters turned up as the first visitors. Mauricio, never had a wizard in town. Welcome, hope you find an adventurer soon. Feindal, I heard you recently had some heartbreak. There's plenty more fish in the sea, don't worry. With the majority of the town now built, Alan spent days 59 to 61 building himself a new house so he could officially reunite his family. Wanting a set place he could call home, he was excited to not be travelling around Skyrim, now he's officially a successful businessman. Days 62 to 65 were spent furnishing the house with everything him and his family would need. 
And with it finished, let's take a look around. Been a few days, I've finally finished the house, so let's do a little walk around. First, got to introduce my new horse, Rogue. Stays outside, helps me get around a lot faster. Very handy to have. Around the other side, a very handy vegetable patch and some beehives so it can grow some produce. And then the best part, I think, is this porch. Lovely little seating area where I can host some parties. Overlooking that view. Heading into the house, nice cosy hallway, just linking everything up, nothing too special here. Heading in here, dining area again to entertain, and we've got someone to introduce, Belle. She helps me run the house when I'm not here. Couldn't do it without it. And then heading through, kitchen, breakfast island. Everything we'd ever need. Just need a chef because I still can't cook. Heading to the other side of the house. Got a study. I can do all of my work here when I'm not at one of the other offices. Still haven't got any books, but I'll get there eventually. Heading into one of the many guest wings. We've got friends from all over Skyrim. So I just want to encourage as many people as I can to come and stay whenever they want. Heading downstairs into the basement. This is the main armory. Got plans to expand massively in the future, so we're going to need a lot of guards for that. So I've got a lot of work cut out for me getting that outfitted with armor, weapons, shields. And this is where it all be stored. And right next door to make those weapons and armor, I've made a basement forge, top of the range. And I've even got a Dwemer extraction fan from a bully print I found. So it's very cool down here, never overheats. And then in here is just a little storage area where I can store my prototype work. So these are things I've been working on recently. And I've also got an arcane enchanter and an alchemy station in case I need to do anything with them. And then last floor. Again, lovely open spacious hallway. This is one of the children rooms. Got a lot of space here. I've heard there's an orphanage in Rifter which is quite badly run so I might head down there and adopt them. The bathroom which has got my now famous geothermal hot tub. And even a working shower, which again is starting to spread all over Skyrim. I'm somewhat of an innovator. And then this is the master bedroom. It's a lot bigger than the one at the farm. So I think I might be moving here permanently. Very, very grand. Everything I'd need here as well. To commemorate nearly finishing the town, I've crafted a blade. This is going to be the symbol of the town. And whoever is the mayor will be given this as sort of a ceremonial rite. So yeah, very happy it's displayed here. And whenever the next mayor comes along, it will be passed down to them. With the house fully built, day 66 was spent building a guest house in the garden. This will be used to house some bodyguards. With Alan being so successful, he wanted to make sure his family were always protected from threats. Day 67, and the guest house was furnished with a bedroom and living area for the new bodyguards who had just arrived into town. Lana, Falco, welcome. Hope you've settled into the new house. Glad to have you on board. Definitely feel safe with you both around. And on day 68, the town of Allenstead is officially complete. And what better way to celebrate than a party in the Fox House Tavern. Alan drinks through the night and can't wait to bring his family to see his hard work. Day 69, and Alan heads to Whiterun to give Carlotta a meal of the good news, officially moving them to Allenstead. And before leaving, spots Lucia, who had recently become an orphan. With more than enough room in the new home, he adopts her and makes sure she never has to beg again. And on day 70, Alan and his family arrive at their new home, and it's nice to see they've settled in quickly. Carlotta, Mila, how are you finding the new house? Settling okay? Got plenty of people to introduce you to around town. They've all been waiting eagerly for you to arrive. And with that, Alan has everything he's ever wanted. Successful businesses, a beautiful family and home. But with a weekly profit of over 18,000 gold from all of his ventures, he knows he can do more to better Skyrim. Why stop at building a town when he can build a city and become a Jarl? Then he can truly help and influence the world of Skyrim. And he makes plans to find land to build the city of Allenhold. Skyrim's Hearthfire DLC was always fun to play, but it should have been something more, especially after seeing that you could build full settlements in Fallout 4 
and some of the amazing mods out there for Skyrim. I've always wondered why the player couldn't buy a chunk of Skyrim land and build their own city. Maybe in Elder Scrolls 6 this will be a feature, but in the meantime I set out to find a mod to scratch that itch in Skyrim, and that's when I stumbled across Build Your Noble House by Locaster, which just so happens to add in an amazing city which I can build from the ground up. So with that, let's drop back into the story of Alan Allenson, who so far has started from nothing, rebuilt his family mine, started his own farm, built his own port and trading ship, and built a village for himself and his employees. Well, we're a few years into the future, and with more money coming in each week than he knows what to do with, why not build a city and become a Jarl? So after years of planning, Alan heads to speak to the Jarl of Falkreath to buy a piece of land to the north. It costs a lot, but it's well placed near Whiterun and Alan's other businesses. We join Alan on day one as he arrives at the pre-built workshop of the new city of Allenhold. The day is spent building a small camp to live in for the next few weeks, and surveying the area in preparation for the huge building projects that are on the way. Day two, and changing into his old work clothes, Alan gets straight to work, spending most of the day gathering stone for the buildings, before travelling to Half Moon Mill to chop wood overnight. This time, Alan isn't bitten by the vampire owners, who become good friends. After a quick nap, Alan wakes up on day three to start reviewing the schematics he's prepared for the town, deciding to start with the basics. Spending the day building a well, in preparation for residents and workers to start moving in. Day four is spent expanding camp, so Alan has space to recruit some city guards. With the new city still at risk from bandit attacks, it's better safe than sorry. He even gets the first shipment of fresh food from Alan's and farm. Day 5 sees the construction of a training camp for the city guards. They need to keep their skills up to a good standard, so they should get a lot of use. Day 6, and Alan builds a wooden gate and walls to protect the camp. After years of building settlements, safety was one thing he had to get right, and with guards, this would be a great start. Day 7 to 10 was spent building guard towers around the camp and at a couple of key places on the road to Alan Hold. This would keep any new residents safe from bandits when they've moved into the city as well as travellers safe on the road. Day 11 was spent travelling to Solitude to hire city guards from Captain Aldous, giving a number of Civil War veterans new jobs away from the chaos, and it'd be rude not to enjoy a night in the Winking Skeeva, it's a tradition for Alan at this point. Day 12, and Alan and the new guards head back to Alan Hall to get settled in, with them receiving custom armour and weapons with the new city colours. How's the new armour feeling? It looks great. Certainly the best Alan some mines produced so far. Top of the range. Day 13 is spent building a lakeside boardwalk and fishing pier. This allows for extra room to expand the city just outside of the camp walls, and the city can start gathering food for themselves from fishing. This will be crucial to supporting the city through winter. Day 14, and the new hunter house is built at the entrance to the city. Again, this will bring in extra food to really start expanding the city, and reduce the reliance on outside shipments from Allen's farm. Day 15, and Alan furnishes the hunter house with a sleeping area for two hunters, as well as a kitchen area for them to prepare the catches each day, ready to be sold to the residents of the city. And on day 16, the new hunter arrives from Allenstead to start up his own business in the city. Calder old friend, good to see you in Allen Hold. Welcome to the city. It's not much now, but I can't wait to show you the finished product. Day 17 is spent continuing the city infrastructure by building a trader shop well placed on the road. This will generate the city some well-needed income from travellers, and allow residents to buy the goods they need to survive. Day 18, and the trader shop is furnished for a shopkeeper to move in, with a sleeping area and a comfortable kitchen and living area. Jaskier from the Khajiit Caravans decides to set up permanently in the city. Jasmine, I'm glad to have you on board. Life will be a bit different from the caravans, but I'm sure you'll enjoy settling in one place. Plus, they'll pass through every once in a while so you can see your old friends. Day 19 was spent building a house ready to hire a lumberjack. With rapid expansion, wood was becoming an issue, so this would be a well needed addition to the city. Day 20 was spent furnishing the lumberjack house with another cosy sleeping area, as well as a kitchen and food welcome pack, so the new lumberjack could get right to work after moving in. Day 21 and Frey arrives in town as the new lumberjack after being sent from Half Moon Mill. Frey, welcome. You've come highly recommended from Half Moon Mill. Let's just hope you don't bite like they do. Day 22, and the city gets its own tavern, after Alan and the Lumberjack work together to build it. With a nice waterfront view, it'd be a good place for the residents to relax, and travellers to rest when passing through town. 
Day 23 and the tavern is fully furnished with a state of the art bar, a stage for bards to perform and a large seating area to accommodate a grown population. And upstairs there's a couple of guest rooms to be rented out to travellers. Day 24 and Alan heads to Falkreef to hire a bartender from the local tavern, returning home after a successful trip. Torin, welcome to Alan Holding, congratulations on your first tavern. Definitely going to be busy, we've got a lot of mouths to feed now. Day 25 and an alchemy store is built. Not only will it help the city make some extra gold, but an alchemist will be able to keep the residents healthy and illness free. Day 26 and the alchemy store is furnished with a large space to keep any potion or ingredient you could ever need, as well as an upstairs sleeping and living area for the incoming alchemist and her family. And on day 27, Alchemist Helda and her son arrive from Allenson Farm after she completed her alchemy training. Helda, welcome. Hope the shop's up to your standards. You've had some good training back at Allenson Farm, so hopefully you can take it on to the next level here. Teddy, welcome. I see you've settled in nicely. Day 28 is spent building beehives on a small chunk of land. This could be used by the alchemy store as an ingredient, but could also be sold by the trader or used to brew mead in the tavern. Day 29 and a house is built to permanently move farmers to the city so it can become completely self-reliant. Fresh vegetables grown all summer would rarely boost the growth. Day 30 and the farmhouse is furnished with a cooking and storage area to prepare food and a separate sleeping area for the farmers when they move in. Day 31 and Alan sections out a number of separate areas ready for crops to be planted and with help builds a windmill so wheat can be ground into flour. I'm sure everyone will enjoy some freshly baked bread. Day 32 and Alan's back to his old farm ready to select some farmers to take back to the big city, picking a couple and heading home. Huh? Enya, Torin, welcome to Alan Holds. Hope the farm's up to standards. Not as big as the old one, but certainly got some space to expand. Day 33 is a rare rest day with Alan helping out around the farm planting apples and berries and exciting vegetables like tomato, just like the old days. Day 34, and Alan is approached by an old man who wants to build a hen house, just not the usual kind. So they get to work building a full sized house with a downstairs residence of chickens. Let's keep an eye on sweet roll in here. Upstairs is a small sleeping and cooking area for this odd man. Rupert, this was what I thought you meant when you said build me a hen house. The designs are very strange, but if you want to live in there, you can live in there. I'll certainly look forward to the eggs. Day 35, and with the help of a new visitor, Ruva, we built a carpenter house, with Ruva conveniently offering his services to the town. His skills will be crucial for bigger projects and expansion. Day 36, and Alan finishes the carpenter's house by adding in some furniture with the usual kitchen and bedroom combination, and a well-made workshop outside for him to ply his trade. Day 37, and the residents all help to build a workshop next to a clay deposit. The workshop will extract clay to be used in other building projects, and maybe even to craft and sell some well-made items. Day 38, and the workshop is fully stocked with items sent from Allenson Mine ready to be sold, and another small living and sleeping area for a miner to start working. Day 39, and Alan heads home to the family mine where his journey began, to transfer a few miners over to the city to work on upcoming projects, and a visit that isn't complete with a night in the tavern with all of his old friends. Day 40 sees Alan travel back to the city with a miner, who both set up the clay mine ready for it to start extracting clay from the deposit. Liana, thanks for agreeing to come back with me. Hope you enjoy your new home. Certainly a lot warmer than Alan's and mine. Day 41, and with a real need for ore and stone, Alan builds scaffolding and an entrance to a small cave, which will shortly be turned into a mine producing resources and gold for the city. Days 42 to 44 are spent filling out the cave with the basics needed to start mining with equipment and scaffolding to keep the miners safe, adding in some lighting and a sleeping and break area so they can get some well deserved rest. Day 45 and more miners arrive from Allenton Mine ready to get to work mining out the iron and stone needed for buildings in the city. The scene, hope you settle in nicely, if you need anything let me know. Duran, seems you've hit a great vein there, keep it up, good work. More, another good vein of ore there, keep it up. Day 46, and a blacksmith is built in the guards camp. This will be needed to process all of the ore coming out of the mine, but also to keep the guards weapons and armour in top fighting condition. And on day 47, a blacksmith arrives from Allenson Mine to get right to work. Egan I welcome, glad to see the trip from Allenson Mine wasn't too arduous. Hope you settle in nicely. 
I'll have a barracks built for you soon enough so you've got somewhere to live. Day 48, and it's about time the guards got a better place to relax. So Alan builds a barracks. With more guards needed to protect the city, this would be a great place for them to live. Day 49, and the barracks is fully furnished with a storage and break area so the guards can prepare for their shifts and a large sleeping quarters to allow every guard to have their own assigned bed. Day 50, and with the space to hire more guards, Alan heads down to the main road to the city to build an advanced post. This would keep the main road a lot safer, but also allow for warnings of any incoming attacks to the city from that direction. Travellers and guards can also rest in the small camp by the guard post. How's the road looking, men? Make sure to keep safe while you're out here. Next shift will be here tomorrow. Day 51, and a city temple is built. With residents worshipping all types of gods, this would be a great place for them to pray, and attend services to really be part of a community. Day 52, and the interior of the temple is finished, with the addition of a shrine and lectern, and seating for the congregation to use during visits. And a travelling priestess also decides to move in. Welcome Astrid, you arrived just in time for the temple to be built. Look forward to having some services in here. With the city of Alnhold now complete, there's just one more thing to build, a home for the new Jarl Alan. So on days 53 to 65, the entire town works to build a mighty castle. It wouldn't only be a home though, in case of emergency, the city residents could move in to be safe. And days 66 to 75 were spent fully furnishing the new castle, so why don't we take a look around the new crib. As soon as you enter, you're welcomed into the Jarl's throne room, with the throne to speak to any visitors with a request, extremely glamorous decorations and trinkets, and even a personal guard for Alan. Moving on to the Grand Hall, which will be used to host banquets and parties with the residents of the city. Who wouldn't want to be invited when the room looks this majestic? And if your social battery runs out, there's even a study filled with the finest works from Tamriel and a comfortable seating area in front of the fire. Someone to talking too much? Well, ignore them with a good book. Or get an education from private tutoring, which is an offer to all residents. Opening a double door leads onto the main corridor of the ground floor, with a kitchen fit for a king on the immediate right. This is more than enough to keep the family fed and the food flowing at banquets. Continuing down the corridor leads to a child's bedroom filled with every toy imaginable. A great area for a growing family and welcoming guests from all over the Allardson business empire. And the final room on this floor is a private guest residence for visitors to stay and enjoy the peace and quiet, with another large sleeping area, but a more private dining area for adults to converse away from prying eyes and ears. Taking the staircase downstairs leads to a display room and armoury. This can keep any rare trinkets secure, but also leaves plenty of room for storing armour and weapons needed in an emergency. Plus, who wouldn't want a tour in what's probably the largest museum space for rare items in Skyrim? Now, heading upstairs to Alan's private quarters, the floor features a large and majestic room featuring a cosy seating area in front of the fireplace, a very nice private bedroom, and a custom-built bath for only the luckiest of guests to use. There is one secret in this room, an opening behind an inconspicuous bookcase. Would-be thieves will be met with a number of puzzles while heading underground, but these are all designed to help keep Alan's rarest treasures safe, including his personal gold, which has become a rather large amount. Exiting the treasure room and continue up the tower leads to a personal room for enchanting, creating staffs and alchemy. With his retirement on the way, it's always good to be able to learn some new skills to keep the mind active. And finally, we arrive at Alan's personal balcony, with a view of his crowning achievement, he truly has come from nothing to become a mighty Jarl. There's just one thing missing, and on day 76, Alan heads to Alanstead to give his family the good news and officially move them into the new home. Lucia, how are you liking the new home? Definitely a bit bigger than we used to, but I'm sure we'll have a good life here. How would you like the new home, Carlotta? We've definitely come a long way since White Run. And with his family reunited, there's nothing more for Alan to do on this adventure apart from officially become a Jarl of Skyrim. Hosting the Jarls from the other nine holes, he is officially sworn in as the 10th Jarl of Skyrim, Alan the Fair, Jarl of Alanstead. And with a personal wealth of over 1 million gold, there's nothing else to do on this adventure other than enjoy retirement. But who knows, maybe another member of the Alanstead family might want to start an adventure in the future.